Thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Gary Isaacson. I'm with ExxonMobil. Just a brief introduction as per the request from the organizer. Started with Exxon in 1985. Um, I graduated from University of Bergen just before that with a PhD in, in geoscience. I've studied uh, the Arctic off and on since then. We, we had a large Arctic regional project that I was involved with uh, in 86 and 87, and it's revisited again each, each 10 years or so. Um, I've also been on assignments to various countries, uh, some interesting ones, Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan. Um, but right now I'm... So at the moment I manage our Arctic uh, Ocean Science Group and the Global Ocean Science and Policy Group. And um, I'd like to talk to you about uh, these four issues, I'll leave you with some insights on these, these four key messages. Uh, I'd like to frame this in terms of the, the energy outlook, the energy situation globally and how the Arctic fits into that, um, and specifically get into um, interactions, work, working relationships with indigenous people, uh, it's part of our so-called national content. That's part of every project we do. Um, protecting the environment. I'll, I'll show you some specific examples on, on, uh, on that in ocean environments. And also the notion that this may be a new frontier. It, in some aspects it is, but also um, some companies like ours, we've been in the Arctic or sub-Arctic area for 90 plus years, and I'll show you quickly some examples of that as well. But first, let's frame this in terms of uh, the energy outlook. Here we see the population trends. On the left bar for each, you see the uh, 2010 population and in 2040 on the right. So tremendous growth in, uh, in Asia, Pacific in particular, and uh, also in Africa. And with that, global progress that drives demand for energy. So that is increasing. Uh, quite drastically, as you can see. In the middle there, we have GDP growth, um, trillions of, of, of dollars um, from 1990 to 2040. And on the far right, uh, the energy demand. And I plotted on top of that the energy saved by increasing conservation measures. It goes from new fuel energy standards for cars, insulation in our homes. It's a whole variety of, of ways to conserve energy, which is exceedingly important in, in this picture, as you can see. Energy use over time, here showing um, years from 1800 to, to, to the future, projection, quadrillion BTUs. You can see that uh, post-1950s or so, how, how this has really taken off. And the mix of those fuels has gone from what you see in brown, which is a biomass-dominated uh, energy source, to coal in the light brown, oil in green, gas in red, and hydropower, nuclear, and other renewables that are really taking off and, and in, will obviously increase in time as we move forward. Um, switching over to the indigenous people engagement that we have, Three focus areas. It's on workforce development, supplier development, and also very strategic plans worked out with these communities on community investments. Could be hospitals, schools, roads in particular. Um, just a quick aside, in, while working in Turkmenistan and Azerbaijan, off to the uh, more remote areas and building, for, uh, building homes for, for, for people who we're living in, in what we would describe as shacks. So it's, it's something that's part of our national content program, bringing syringes and just very simple first aid equipment into Turkmenistan where you go into the hospitals in Ashgabat and see the same syringe soaked in blood from the previous patient used over and over again. You know, you just, we can do so much better. So bringing that into the country as a, as a little bit of help, but something that... Uh, Obviously, when we're in a community, we, we try to strengthen even more. Um, one example here with some, some numbers uh, for the, the work we're doing in Sakhalin and in um, far eastern Russia. Uh, more than 13,000 jobs by year end, 
2012, 90% of those were by Russian nationals. Um, two out of three dollars investment vested in this is spent doing business with Russian companies or joint ventures where Russian companies are involved. Um, and year to date, I would say that it has a lasting, has had a lasting positive effect on the local economy. That looking forward, we're expecting the community investment to be more than 180 million in that area. And it goes along with both a deep respect for and promotion of local cultures, customs, and open consultations with, with indigenous people. And uh, Genevieve, the speaker before me, having worked somewhat with us in, uh, in the Beaufort area, can, can attest to the work we're doing there as well with uh, Imperial Oil. Um, these, this approach is, is uh, as many of you are, are aware, is, is very consistent with the principles of, of uh, these, these various conventions, declarations, and uh, uh, guidelines by both the World Bank and the International Finance Corporation. We have over 90 years of experience in Arctic or subarctic uh, areas, shown here by the red squares on the map. Um, and I'll quickly go through some of these. Norman Wells, discovered in the 1920s, uh, first gravel production island to, uh, to access oil below a river area. Alaska, um, long history from the mid-60s, as you can see there on the right. Uh, and also the, um, in fact, um, the geothermal energy is used to coming up these legs here, as you can see on the transatlantic, uh, sorry, trans-Alaska pipeline system to make sure that uh, the, the thawing, freezing is, is controlled. And of course, we had in 89 a very tragic accident with the Exxon Valdez, from which um, uh, the company really uh, uh, refocus its commitment to, to safeguards. You may have heard in the previous uh, session uh, the importance of performance-based uh, safety for people, safety for operations, safety for the environment. So that's something that's, that's uh, within all the projects that we do. The Beaufort Sea, again, with imperial oil, uh, indigenous people engagement from uh, 2008 to 2011 with uh, members of the Inuvialuit community participating in marine mammal observation studies in some of the seismic contracts awarded uh, and so forth. Eastern Canada, a uh, lot of work on um, understanding iceberg movement, uh, developing structures that will withstand certain icebergs, uh, cer certain sizes, grappling with uh, uh, the impacts of, of icebergs in particular. Grand Banks, this is the picture of the Hibernia platform. On the collar of this, you'll see barely in that photo there, there's a, like a diamond-shaped uh, collar that would move around if an iceberg was to come close to it. Of course, way before that would happen, uh, icebergs are monitored, They've, they're pushed away with tugboats, but uh, just in the worst case scenario, it can, it's been designed to withstand icebergs with, an, with a weight of approximately three times the Empire State Building. So quite a massive structure in off eastern Canada. And with Sokolin, as I mentioned, uh, since uh, the mid to late 90s, working there, it's the world's largest land-based drilling rig that's installed uh, with extended reach drilling about seven kilometers offshore. So that's one of the world records, as you can see there in the lower right, of, uh, of uh, one mile. Supply for Arctic hydrocarbons. Um, there's generally a lack of, thank you, lack of infrastructure. Uh, we're in many cases a long distance from fabrication yards. The supply ch chain is complex. We have short summer installation windows to deal with. Um, it, it's, a, it's a tough climate to work in. And the need for specialized vessels, as you've, as you've seen in some of the previous talks. We've had Arctic research programs going on um, 
both within our company and in collaboration with, with various university groups and other institutes for, I, I can attest to since, since I started in the mid-80s. And um, looking at extended season drilling capabilities, a lot of work on, on high-strength steel and steel that's needed for Arctic conditions, a lot of work on understanding uh, the pr ice pressures that various structures need to resist, um, um, and also, very recently, in June this year, we, together with Rosneft, established the Arctic Research Center in Moscow. So that, we envision, will be a, a hub for more and more activity, especially in the Ru Russian Arctic, working very closely with our Russian academic colleagues. Um, protection of the environment, exceedingly important, um, which, again, will be a focus of the Arctic Research Center. Uh, along with personnel safety programs, engagement with indigenous people, sea ice management, uh, various ge geotechnical and mid-ocean surveys, um, design criteria for, uh, for areas. Um, and a quote here you can read for yourself from Igor Sechin, the, the president of uh, Rosneft. The initial funding for this is uh, most is shared between the two companies, with uh, lion share coming from ExxonMobil. And again, as I said, starting in started in June 2013, and it's in in Moscow. One thing that's been a, a big challenge in working offshore Sakhalin has been the protection of the western gray whales. Um, there's a population of the, the gray whales that's there along the from Sea of Okutsk down to down to Korea. Um, these are often referred to as Korean gray whales as well. Uh, different from, or uh, especially in spatial terms, the population that we see from Alaska, Canada, to the U.S., down to Mexico even. So um, a lot of our field work and baseline studies for the environment look into um, photo identification of them, uh, where are they at different times of year? What do they feed? What is their general health? Uh, where do they migrate? And so forth. You may have seen in the news um, last two years, some of them were tagged. We employed Russian scientists and the University of um, Oregon uh, to do that tagging, and two of them swam over <laughs> through the Aleutian Islands, down the Pacific coast of, the, of Canada and the U.S., down to Mexico to to, to breed and, and swam back. So there is some degree of, of mixture between the two. Um, you can see those on those websites, as I see, show you on the, on the bottom of the page. The Russian Arctic is indeed a, an important uh, frontier. Um, huge exploration acreages, as you can see in this, uh, this map. Um, just the area in and to the east of Novaya Zemlya is about the same size as the entire Gulf of Mexico, just for size comparison. Um, significant investments are being made um, with uh, very large reserves, as you can see estimated there by, by Rosneft. Key to us and key to with, within the specific programs I work is to make sure we, we understand and protect the, the bowhead whales in particular, the, uh, the walrus population, especially as we move further east, um, beluga whales, uh, narwhals, uh, and polar bears. So these are active programs that are under different stages of development. Um, I'm getting a 10-member panel together to, to specifically look at what we can do to safeguard walrus habitat further east. We're working with these groups, as you can see on the bottom of this slide, Russians, Canadians, Norwegians, on uh, understanding the distribution and uh, habitat of these different uh, seal species, harp seals, hooded seals, gray seals, and harbor seals, uh, basically from northeast Greenland uh, over to Svalbard, over to Novaya Zemlya uh, in, in particular, and down to, to the Murmansk area. So that's, uh, that's data that you can also access from these, these sources on the bottom. A very exciting new study is looking at, the vision is to be able to, like we would with a blood sample from a human, be able to tell quite a lot about the health of an individual, to take a, a water sample from uh, areas uh, that are uh, where we have less information, and through environmental DNA, 
be able to understand or get a glimpse of what types of, of organisms, uh, all the way up to size of whales, uh, would be present in that area. So we're cu currently working with the North Slope Borough, uh, with Patel, to, to, um, to uh, un undertake this type of research in the uh, Elson Lagoon, northern slope of Alaska. We're comparing that with catch data that uh, we get from fishermen and gill nets to, to see if we can get some semi-quantitative data. Spend a little bit of time next, a little bit of time next on sound in the ocean. It's it's critically important because we're when operating in the Arctic in the marine environment, uh, we're in the world of of the ocean giants. We're in the world of of marine mammals, and their world is one of sound. We're interested in the intensity of the sound, the pitch or the frequency, uh, and the duration of the sound. Is it continuous or is it impulsive, for example? And also how in 3D this sound uh, propagates away from a sound source, be it a ship's propeller or pile installation or, or seismic exploration or whatever the sound source may be. Um, as I said, we're in their world. Uh, they use sound to communicate for free feeding, uh, breeding and orientation, and we want to make sure that we uh, minimize the impact as much as possible. These are the loudest sound sources. Um, cavitation from ship propellers is one concern. Uh, seismic air guns is another. Construction and drilling. And th through the work I'll show you in the next several slides, we've been able to, to mitigate the risks associ associated with these quite well. Um, schematically, you can think of it as there's a sound source. The sound propagates through uh, the water. Uh, there's a biological receiver and different species here in different frequ frequency ranges from the deep bass tones of, a, of a, uh, say, a blue whale to the high chirping sounds of a, of, a, uh, of a dolphin, for example. And then working with academics, this is all done through funding of through academic work at universities around the world. You know, what is the impact on the animal? Is there any physical injury or is there any or behavioral industry, uh, injury or changes? And is that significant for the population? With the work that's in place, with the mitigation measures we have, we're able to take injury off the table. In other words, we can protect the environment around these sound sources very well and so that we don't cause any injury. We do cause a behavioral change. Any one of us would cause a behavioral change, albeit a minor one, if we were out in a boat and caused a, a whale to change its direction of swimming. In the U.S. The regulatory framework, that's called a level B take. You, call, you, you, you change its, its behavior based on a, a human-induced uh, situation. So we're trying to, to uh, minimize that as well to make sure that especially we don't have any uh, impact on, that is significant for the population. Um, oops, sorry. All this is, as you may have seen from those of you who were, who were here for the DNV talk, um, it's all dealt with, with risk-based assessments. We have internal standards for this. We do environmental studies ahead of time, 3D sound modeling, and then risk assessments on, uh, uh, as you can see in the lower right. Some of these mitigation measures are shown here. There could be restrictions in time and space, making sure that we're out of the way when uh, feeding and breeding occurs or migration routes, making sure that we're out of those areas using what's called a soft start technology, which is a gradual increase in sound to make sure that uh, any marine mammals that would be sensitized to that sound would move away. Um, there are marine fauna observers on board uh, during daylight hours and during nighttime if the, if the exploration activity continues, it's monitored with so-called PAMGARD in many cases, uh, passive acoustic monitoring. And different countries have different exclusion zones. Um, we try to, to, to adhere to an international standard, bringing all uh, users of the ocean that employ, have some sound to, to respect the general exclusion zones and not just adhere to a, a local one that may be a lesser one. Uh, since 2006, we've started a joint industry program with the companies listed there on the bottom. Uh, funding's about 
eight, uh, sorry, six million dollars per year goes to various universities that uh, have research proposals come in to address the objectives that I have listed in the middle. So quite a lot of good results to date. Uh, there's been significant scientific progress. And with government funding in many areas drying up, um, this industry funding and industry government partnership is, is used as, a, as a, uh, a role model of how to do this type of, of science. All the results you can see there at sanamarinelife.org, and it covers these five uh, research areas. Lastly, let me just change hats and uh, um, uh, make a plug for the World Ocean Council. Um, I'm on the, the board there, and uh, we're trying to, to develop that to be a cross-industry um, point of contact for, for example, working with the uh, subgroups in the Arctic Council uh, and uh, tackling priority Arctic issues for a broader set of industry. So with that, you've, uh, you've had a glimpse of those four key message areas I wanted you to, uh, to, to have some insight into. Thank you.